Hey Crashers, we're at a moment many of you have been waiting for. The superheroes have arrived. We've reached the era most frequently referred to as the Golden Age. We talked about the Golden Age of newspaper strips, but this is what most people call the Golden Age. It starts in 1938 with the arrival of Superman in Action Comics number 1, and generally is considered to end with the implementation of the Comics Code in 1954. Now, we're likely going to do a deep dive into the Golden Age and its important creators in the future, but for now, I'll do my best to provide a simultaneously brief and thorough historical overview on what is probably one of the most significant moments in 20th century American popular culture, the creation of superheroes. And there is something uniquely American about superhero comics. While the genre draws from a variety of sources, including classical mythology, adventure novels, pulp science fiction, and even strongman performances in circus shows, the particular mix of tropes that come together to create the superhero story is something that comes together uniquely in the U.S. at this particular moment. That's right, the U.S. doesn't have much cultural output that's uniquely its own. But we do have jazz and superheroes, and that's something pretty good. So why superheroes? This is a tough question, but I think it has something to do with the tension between the importance of the individual in American culture. And what is the superhero but the ultimate individual? And a sense of obligation and celebration of community. The superhero is a kind of fantasy that puts in tension the desire for ultimate power that is tempered by moral clarity and responsibility to community. It's a strange, tricky fantasy, but one that obviously still fascinates us to this day. Again, we will do a deep dive in the future. I promise. Superheroes are one of the things that I work on and I'm very fascinated by, so we'll come back. But now it's time to turn to the moment of the birth of the superhero. And it's in the comic books. In addition to being uniquely American, superheroes are uniquely in comic books. In fact, it is a genre that was created in comics. So last week I mentioned the Phantom, who is perhaps the clearest precursor to the superhero. But what makes a superhero a superhero? Scholars and fans will get in long fights about this, but what tends to set superhero stories apart from other kinds of heroes are one, some kind of extraordinary superhuman ability, two, a dual identity, one that defines the superhero and one that defines a kind of personal life. Often the personal life is kept secret, but not always. And three, some sort of costume that defines and separates the superhero from the individual. It's usually, but not always, colorful. The Phantom had dual but not secret identities, his role was inherited through the family. He did have a costume, but he didn't have particularly superhuman powers. The book was much more of a jungle adventure book, which was a really popular genre at the time, than it was a genuine superhero book. But then Action Comics number one hit, with the now iconic cover. A guy in tights and a cape lifting a car over his head. A man we discover is called Superman. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, the kids of Jewish immigrants living in Cleveland, had been shopping the idea around with no success until the folks at National Allied Publications decided to take the chance. And so Superman was introduced to the world on April 18th, 1938. It wasn't uncommon for books to be released before their cover date. And it was an instant hit. Action Comics number one's first print run of 200,000 sold out completely. It's worth noting, in case you're not familiar with older comic books, that Superman wasn't the only character in Action Comics number one. The book was 68 pages long, compared to the average 22 pages of a contemporary comic book, and Superman's story only took up the first 12 pages. The rest of the book featured several one-page funny stories, a prose story of adventure on the high seas, and seven other comic stories. Obviously, Superman was the star. He featured every month, and within a few years, he would get his own spin-off title. By 1940, Superman, the spin-off title, would have a circulation on its own of about 1.2 million a month. Let me give you some context. The best-selling comic book of 2017 was Marvel Legacy No. 1, which sold around 305,000 units the whole year. You would have to add together the circulation numbers of the top six best-selling books of 2017 to get the same number that the Superman book would sell per month in 1940. And once it was clear that Superman was a hit, well, everybody started doing superheroes. They popped up everywhere. Some familiar names began to appear during the Golden Age, most of them that we associate with DC, 
Marvel's big heroes didn't actually come up until the Silver Age. We'll talk about that later. Batman debuted in Detective Comics number 27 in 1939. Later that year saw the introduction of Captain Marvel, better known as Shazam, in Wiz Comics number 2. In 1940, The Flash debuted in Flash Comics number 1, and The Green Lantern in All American Comics number 19. In early 1941, Captain America Comics number 1 introduced us to Cap punching Hitler in the face, a whole year before Pearl Harbor, by the way, and later that year, Wonder Woman first appeared in All Star Comics number 8, followed by a full debut in Sensation Comics number 1. At their height, both Shazam and Captain America would outsell Superman, and all three would outsell Time Magazine in their best-selling months. However, the search for a new hit superhero didn't always go so well. Heroes like the Red Bee, who had trained bees in his belt, his favorite was named Michael, Dollman, who got small and was created by the great Will Eisner, Catman and his sidekick Kitten, the terrifying Black Terror and his sidekick Tim, Microface, who doesn't have a small face, alas, it's just that he can throw his voice, the Moth, the Green Turtle, the source of Jean Yang and Sunny Liu's great book, The Shadow Hero, or Dr. Hormone, who fights crime with his granddaughter, all spring to mind as less than successful ideas. Interestingly, there were quite a few women superheroes in this era. Some were very cool, and others were weird. There were even some women creators in the mix, like Tarpe Mills, whose character Miss Fury predated Wonder Woman's first appearance by several months. The rapid rise of comics publishing continued throughout the 1940s, and even jumped during World War II. At the beginning of the war, somewhere near around 15 million comic books were published a month, but two and a half years into the war, that had almost doubled to 25 million a month. And the content reflected the impact of the war. A huge spate of patriotic superheroes like American Crusader, American Eagle and Eaglet, Eagle and Buddy, Flagman and Rusty, and Yankee Doodle Jones all began appearing on the stands. Comics frequently appeared in care packages for soldiers. In fact, the U.S. military was the largest institutional purchaser of comic books. Of course, as the patriotic superheroes show, comic books were also used as propaganda for readers back home. For example, Superman never fought in the war. You would think that he could have ended the war by himself, and the authors of the comic thought that this might be disrespectful to the people who were stuck fighting on the front. So in the story, Clark Kent goes to sign up, and in his anxiousness to pass his physical, he accidentally uses his x-ray vision to read the chart in the next room. He is declared 4F and is forced to do what he, and of course Superman, can in Metropolis. So, so he, as Superman, Batman, and Robin, and the rest of the Justice League advertised victory gardens and promoted war bonds, loans, and stamps. After World War II, superhero comics began to dip from their insane heights of popularity. There are a lot of reasons, but many scholars speculate that it's due in part to their close association with the war and the desire to move on from that war, as well as some changing ideas about heroism. But comics kept going strong. It turns out superheroes were far from the only genre of comics, and even at their most popular, they were frequently eclipsed by other genres. But that's enough for its own video. So we'll talk about what else was going on during the Golden Age next time. See you then.